familiar with it, given its location and everything else, but you are producing a significant number of cars largely for domestic consumption. Help us understand, because of the level of disruption and therefore the threat to globalization that there is, help us understand the kind of difficulties and challenges you've been trying to deal with with Uzauto and give us some background as well so those who don't know Uzauto can know the kind of um, challenges but the kind of customers you have, the kind of market you have as well. And those of you out there, please do send messages. And I hope Mike Froman is joining us. Mike, if you can hear us, uh, do at least nod. I'm just introducing Bo Anderson, uh, who's joining us from Uzbekistan. Welcome. Um, but I'll come back to you in a moment if you can hear me. Um, Bo, take it away and tell us more about the challenges you've been facing. Thank you, Nick, and, and to the whole audience. So first, I, I've been in Uzbekistan for roughly six months. Uh, I'm the CEO of, of Uzafto Motors and Uzafto um, Powertrain. Uh, we were normally a part of Jana Motors, uh, but up to the last three years, we have been 100% owned by the Uzbek government. As Nick said, we produce roughly 300,000 vehicles every year, all under the brand name of Chevrolet. So our partner is Jana Motors. We are allowed to produce and sell vehicles under the Chevy brand name. Our main market is the Uzbek local market. Our second market or our biggest export market is Kazakhstan. Then it is Russia and then it is Azerbaijan. The challenges that we have had is like everyone else. It started with semiconductors. And I also reflected a little bit on what is globalization and what will happen with transportation. If I just give you one flavor, if you take a 40 feet container, you can get in thousand tires in a 40 feet container. Uh, so not very easy to ship tires. The next one is airbag modules. You get 25,000 airbag modules in a container. And the third one is semiconductors. You get 4 million semiconductors. So what I've done the last six months is chasing parts from semiconductors to radios to steel. And what I've done in January and February is to deal with uncertainty in Kazakhstan, uh, our largest export market. And the last eight days I've been working on securing production, securing delivery to customers, making sure that our international uh, air or sea shipments are coming in, either from US, Brazil, Mexico, China, or Korea. If I talk about Korea and China, most of that comes into Vladivostok and then spend time on the Russian railroad going into Kazakhstan and stopping here. So in summary, with my P team, we have been focused on, on four things, taking care of the people. Secondly, improving our production quality and our deliveries. Third, making sure we are cost competitive. And fourth, we are introducing two brand new vehicles, the Chevy Tracker and Chevy Onyx, here in the next 12 months. What kind of gymnastics, Bo, have you been going through to try and maintain production? And what has been the implication for cost? I would say that for 15 years, I was head of GM purchasing and supply chain uh, with roughly 190,000 part numbers, 165 plants in 100 countries. But the last six months have been more challenging. And why? Because of uncertainty. Uh, we were flying for $20 million uh, last year. Sometimes it was hard to get an airplane. Sometimes three companies were fighting for the same airplane, but we got them. And we have had a good start in January and February, but then the last eight days I've been struggling to see what do I need, where do I buy it, and more importantly, Nick, where is my suppliers buying their parts? So the whole visibility of the supply chain, and that has been, I would say, the last eight days. What about, I use the word gymnastics though, both mental gymnastics and literally gymnastics on your software and so on. Have there been, what does this tell you about the state of globalization now? I think looking at global automotive, with COVID, the industry lost more or less 20 million vehicles. So we went from 
97 million vehicles in 2017 to 77 million. In many areas, the OEMs focus on what customers are willing to pay for. But secondly, it, it challenged the whole model of globalization. It challenged the whole model of transportation. And I personally don't think that we will have what we used to have. What we will have in the future, I don't know. But it will not be what we had two years ago. Do you think it'll be more difficult, significantly more difficult? Because we've been joined by Henry Scherenberg, who is the ambassador of Harassis to Ukraine. And we'll come on to, to him in a moment. But what you can see, whether it be in the port of Odessa, or you can just see um, what is happening in the crisscrossing of supply lines in a place like Ukraine, with the potential of much worse in many more countries if this goes on significantly. What does that mean for you trying to juggle keeping a domestic car production going in Uzbekistan, reliant on parts coming from significant other countries, including now, I think you mentioned that uh, you're bringing in parts via Turkey, which you haven't been doing before, but that has increased costs by 40% by rail. Yeah, I mean, first, I think for me being in automotive most of my life, customers are getting better and better educated. Customer has more and more information online. They can compare. Secondly, affordability is an issue and will be an issue. So the important thing, global OEMs must be cost competitive. And as I talked about before, we are looking at everything we can do different. So we used to be dependent on getting in goods to St. Petersburg. We have now rerouted that into Istanbul, but at the cost of 40% more. Henry, as you've joined us, and I was yes. making an introduction, I'm not going to talk specifically about what's happening in Ukraine at the moment, because everyone is aware sure. of, of the enormity and the, the horror of what's happening. But what is, what is your estimate, particularly with the port of Odessa, now being yes. threatened by, by, by Russian ships. What is your impression, given that if we were talking 10 days ago, we wouldn't be talking like this at all, but there has been a collapse of so much which has to be respected in Ukraine. I was there myself three months ago. The incredible kind of very first world um, existence, the fact that a lot of IT is done for Western countries in Ukraine, in back offices and so on. It's an extraordinary, uh, an extraordinarily talented country. But to, to address the kind of things that we're talking about with Bo at the moment, and hopefully with Mike Froman, who will join us from MasterCard, what is, what is your impression of the impact that this is going to have on supply lines and therefore the global position of a nation like Ukraine? Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be on your panel. Like, uh, the, I want to address, obviously, as you mentioned, Odessa is the lifeblood of Ukrainian logistics. As you know, Ukraine is a big exporter of agro uh, materials of all types. Uh, I believe we're first or second in sunflower and obviously grain and like. So Ukraine lives through Odessa, uh, Ukraine ports. So if you talk about logistics issue, as our previous uh, our panelists also discussed right now, we are having COVID issues related to logistics that have been a big, big problem around the world. If you add to this that Black Sea will be unusable, it's going to be a disaster across the world in terms of logistics. For Ukraine itself, Odessa is critical. Odessa is critical for the survival of the country and a country a GDP ability to, you know, simply work and function throughout the economy. Add to this all the railroads, or add to this right now the infrastructure of Ukraine, airports in particular, are being bombarded or being taken out of commission. So Ukraine is becoming a, a victim of uh, this horrific events that are happening now, but those events will drastically change logistics around the world. And what about employment in factories, in the big on on enterprises which uh, Ukraine has developed? A fantastic sort of initiative, startups and so on. What is your feeling at this moment? Well, Can prior you... to this war, prior to this war, it always says you cannot oligarchize the mind, right? Mm. Ukraine is so advanced now technologically. Most my job, this is what I do all day as an honorary president of World Trade Center, Kiev. Uh, my job is to promote opportunity Ukraine. So therefore, for Ukrainians right now, the word, the, the, if, if you can take any positive of anything that's happening, now, the whole world knows about Ukraine. The whole care, world cares finally about Ukraine. Uh, 
And as you talk about logistics right now, we're talking about our friends in Kazakhstan and many other countries in Uzbekistan and the part of the Middle East there. Our job now is to unite because we can solve logistics problems. But if as this morning, our in Zaporozhye nuclear plant was under attack, this is something we need to worry about now because logistics cannot work if we are dealing with nuclear ash. We've got a lot of we've got a lot of people joining us who are obviously joining us because we're talking about globalization. Let me go right. back to Bo because Bo, you mentioned um, Kazakhstan, and things can happen amazingly quickly in many parts of the world, not just in your part of the world. When you look back to the unrest that there was in Kazakhstan, particularly in Almaty, uh, and the attacks and the the demonstrations, particularly over fuel prices only, and I was in Kazakhstan back in November. What is your? How do you react? How do you, given your position as chief executive of a big company, how do you respond to this? And how quickly? How nimble? How flexible? How agile is your system to be able to adapt to maintain the production of fifteen hundred cars a day? I mean, first, I'm I'm very impressed with how our local government in in Uzbekistan reacted in this situation. Uh, they took very clear corrective actions. Secondly, as a businessman, we normally sell forty thousand vehicles in Kazakhstan, and together with our partner in Kazakhstan, we we stopped uh, sales. But I'm also happy to say that we were very quickly back. But it's something that happened overnight, and we were not ready. But we reacted very quickly, and we had full support of our government, uh, of our prime minister and president. And it reminds about how fragile we are, and that business today is something different than business ten years ago. How do you reckon you've adapted? You know, you've been in the car business, the auto business, for so long. Are there still things that surprise and even shock you? And you, there, are, there are things where you, there are days when you say, "Can we get through today?" I met with some of our government representatives here, and I said I, I work seven days a week, every week, not because I like to, but because I need to. Are you sometimes overwhelmed by the the way you have to be so flexible and doing things which you never expected to do in order to maintain production? I, I've told the government I'm not a superman, but I will give them all the experience I have. But yes, I, I I've been challenged more in the last six months than I was during my whole career. Because I'm doing this project on thinking the unthinkable, and in many ways, a, a company like yours, an enterprise like yours, is facing unthinkables which probably were never on your business plan, even if you were thinking about it four to five months ago. That, that's correct, and and our partner, we are 100% dependent on General Motors. General Motors, they have also had challenges that they have never had before. And most of the large OEMs, they produce 60% of the planned production because of lack of semiconductors. So a part that normally we as consumers don't even think about crippled the whole industry and took out 20 million units of production in one year. Could we say then, based on your experience and the experience of many others in the manufacturing sector, that actually this extraordinary situation with semiconductors has really, in many ways, undermined undermined the effectiveness of globalization, the smoothness of globalization, along with the non-availability literally of containers. Or if you can get a container, it's not $2,000, it's $18,000. No, I, I understand the green, Nick, and I could even go that far that many of the companies that are Americans felt that they were not the priority for Asian manufacturers. Many of the European manufacturers felt that they were not the priority for the Asian semiconductors manufacturers. And that's why you see an increased production in Europe uh, for automotive semiconductors and companies like Intel announcing that they will do semiconductors in the United States. So this was not on the table six months ago or 12 months ago. Because I've been doing global business in, in automotive for 37 years. And we were always viewing that people did what is right. Now, what I, uh, come in, Henry. What I'd like to do is tell you that we've got about um, uh, 25 minutes left. But I can already see, I think, 
that there are several people who'd like to intervene. So I'm going to come to them in a moment. So stand by Daniel Zaretsky, first of all, and I'm going to try and get as many comments as possible. But keep your comments brief as well, please. Henry. Uh, uh, Nikki, if I may, I want to, uh, because I would both point out a couple of great things in this part. Uh, in Ukraine, is uh, you, you, you're you talking about doing unthinkable. Right now, prior to the war, with the CEO of Ukrpochta, it's a post office in Ukraine, Igor Smilansky, we were working on building a first logistics park for uh, for the logistics park in the airport Borispol. Ukrpochta itself has 67 hubs to be built in Ukraine. So those of you who work in logistics, automotive or otherwise, Ukraine is a, has a great potential to become uh, 21st century logistics, an intelligent logistical hub of the world. That's what Ukrainian can do. For the companies in Kazakhstan and many other countries from all over the world, Ukraine geographical location in the center of Europe, it's total, uh, it, it, it just makes total sense to be the hub where a lot of goods can be assembled and moved to Europe tax-free because we have this association with European Union. Okay, a lot of goods can be assembled or just passed through in Ukraine, which creates jobs for Ukraine. And that's a lot of things can be done because as we talk about Intel and microchips, Ukraine, as you pointed out, Nick, is has enormous brain power, enormous brain. It does need a lot of management know-how. You know, it need big players to produce microchips here in transistors here. Everything can be done in Ukraine, and Ukraine has become part of this global system. That's number one. Number two point I want to make. We are prior to the war. We are, one of our massive projects was creating a bioeconomy based on a culture called Miscanthus. It's a perennial. It's a biomass. It's a biomass that allows us to launch completely new industries, green industries, bioplastics, biopaper. Miscanthus has more cellulose than trees do. Biopharmaceuticals. Right, bioconstruction materials and so on. That's what Ukraine can do. And logistics has to be a huge part of it. Because remember, companies will not drive miscounters of raw material from Ukraine to America. They will need to bring manufacturing here to Ukraine to create jobs out of the raw material and then build the supply chain from there after. And that's what we want Ukraine to be a global right. intelligent logistical hub. Thank you. Let's keep talking about globalization. I hope this is going to work. Daniel Zaretsky, are, are you are you there? I'm hoping the system will work. Um, and I'm going to give you the microphone. Can you can you get the microphone? Daniel, are you able to or not? Oh, there it comes. Please. Hi, I'll be very quick. Daniel, Hi. speak. I'll just say, Henry, great stuff. Uh, Daniel, uh, great to see you, buddy. Yeah. Thank you. And I just want to uh, ask uh, Bo also, I've, I've worked many years in Central Asia, in Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan. I'm probably headed back to the region shortly. Can you can you tell me, though, I mean, Central Asia, trading across borders, the, 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 the indicators are, you know, bottom, all countries are in the bottom 10 of the world at least two years ago or so. Can you tell me, being in Uzbekistan, which has made such big reforms, uh, what what reforms you see there, and what 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 do you need? What do you still uh, think the region needs to do to improve in these these type of things, becoming more part of the global supply chain and uh, trading across its own borders? Thank you. Very in much. other words, Bo, given the history of Uzbekistan and the liberation that's now taking place, what is the status in a globalized world of a country like Uzbekistan now? There you go. Well, first, I'm, I'm very impressed with the reform plan that the government have put in place. Uh, secondly, it's extremely important with transparency. Third, it's very important with privatization. And fourth, that you bring in international experts like myself that educate the population. I'm extremely impressed with the workers I have in Uzbekistan. They're young, they are intelligent, and they are willing to learn. The challenge that I've said to the government is putting out an objective of doubling the GDP in five years. It's a bold objective. I hope they have the power and the stamina to carry that through. Good. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, let me go to Nicholas Johnson, if I may. Nicholas, can you come in? I'm going to go through as many of the faces that I can see on my screen here as possible. Nicholas. Your chief executive at Economists Without Borders. Nicholas, grab the mic. <laughs> Can you grab the mic? 
I'm inviting you on the stage according getting ready for the stage it says Nicholas are you are you are you available otherwise I'll invite somebody else No, I would like to invite you to train after all it's over. We can talk about automotives here. <laughs> War is over because uh, we actually work in Zaporozhye, you know, the former Russian plant. Uh, you know, there's a lot of great ideas happening there now. Remember, Ukraine has the one of the largest lithium batteries deposits. I mean, lithium deposits. Uh, so a lot of battery production can be done here in obviously automotive as well. All right, Nicholas can't join me. Stuart Hutton, are you able to join us? Um, CIO of, uh, and founding member of Other Dots. Stuart, are you able to come in, please? Yes, we can. <laughs> are you there, Stuart? I I am. I don't, can you hear me? Fire away. Yes. We can't see you, but fire away. Give us I a... I have no idea why my camera's please. not on. Um, so, yeah, I just think I'm, I'm just very interesting because... We've, we've seen a, a real shift um, over the last few years with so many events around the world going back both certainly politically, but in terms of the current events where globalization is not necessarily going to be the answer. Um, and it's going to become more of a concern as countries, especially around energy, are going to look for more sustainability. And, and what I'm really interested in hearing about is do the speakers and, and Nick yourself as well. Do you see this as a new form of sustainable growth and how we manage that going forward? Or is this going to be a barrier to development around the world and how this kind of features in some of the some of the big issues we have around things, for example, like climate change? Bo, do you want to, do you want to come in? And Natalie Samovich, would, would you like to stand by as well? I'll try and come to you after Bo has answered. Again, when you look at automotive, uh, I've been working on electrical vehicles since 1993. I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer, but it will not be the solution because... I think we'll have 50% of our vehicles electric and 50% something else. What that is, I don't know. Only 50%. That's my guess. I hope I'm wrong. How much is it in a place like Uzbekistan, which is a developing country, how much will EVs become part of the, the environment there? If I remember right, if, if we sold roughly 200,000 vehicles last year, I think 5,000 were electrical. Mm, okay. By the that way, means... in Ukraine, electrical vehicles had the fastest growth in uh, all the history of Ukraine. Yeah, it's very so... noticeable in uh, very noticeable in Kiev, certainly. Natalie, are you able to join us, please? The mic's coming towards you. It's creeping towards you. I hope it's going to reach you quickly. Do you have the microphone now, Natalie? Natalie, are you able to join us or not? Do you have the microphone? Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. You're the head of innovation strategy for the Resilient Group. Go ahead. Um, yes, so there are lots of angles and the uh, um, angle of energy is transversal. It's the most important one. And I think it will play more and more important role in the global global peace and um, um and, and the balancing. I think the solutions are becoming more and more distributed and uh, the, the topic of uh, EVs is, is one angle, but it doesn't stop there because we're going to have also the uh, um, green hydrogen driven vehicles um, and other solutions uh, coming up as well. So I think the message is, is uh, to keep the doors open for uh, all of the solutions and also we know that they are not isolated you know, together with the EVs and the uh, green vehicles also the angle of smart grids and better management of grids, better efficiencies and greater penetration of renewables. So these are all interlinked solutions. Let me just press you, if I may. We are yes. talking about globalization. And I, I, maybe you weren't on at the beginning, but I said, is it actually about the survival of globalization now as opposed to the rebirth of globalization? What's your instinct from where you are resilient? I think it's reverse. I think we need um, uh, deeper thinking on on the approaches, um, on the balance, and uh, I think we need uh, to find more answers to that. In other words, you you yes. think it's rather you think it's rather fragile at the moment. It is rather fragile indeed. Can it can it be 
regain? Can a new strength be regained given what we're facing in Ukraine, what we're facing with the climate emergency as well, with the kind of changes which have got to take place? And the, the real concerns that something much bigger is going to happen across Europe because of what's happening in Ukraine. Disruption, in other, in other words. In, indeed, the disruption already took place during during the uh, um, you know the pandemic. Um, so this is this is not the first disruption that we're experiencing within the past uh, uh, two years. But and the rethinking uh, is already. Uh, is taking place, you know, in, in, in Europe, what I can speak of is, uh, is the efforts related to the uh, project of strategic importance, uh, such as uh, IPSI on hydrogen, such as IPSI on, uh, um, on uh, solar production. Um, so I, I think we are already in the process of rethinking. All right. What I'd like to do, if I may, Alistair Haythorn-Thwaite is joining us or has, has his hand up. The reason I'm going to Alistair is because if you're there, Alistair, is because you are Senior Vice President um, at MasterCard USA. And in fact, Mike Froman, your Vice Chairman, was going to join us. If you're there, do you, is there a contribution you'd like to make on his behalf? Alistair. Maybe not. Do you want to pick up, Bo, on uh, what you just heard? Uh, those remarks about the fragility of globalization. Again, I can only talk about global automotive. So if you take global automotive, the main focus is to build where you sell. And there's maybe one or two exceptions and in Germany that produce luxury cars and export. And in Japan, each one of them export roughly 3 million. However, there's also lack of capital in some areas and in some areas too much capital more and more of our high-tech industry requires a lot of capital and that's why i think globalization will still be there because you will have clusters that are experts and logistics we have had logistics for thousands of years i think there's always a new frontier is reality changing faster though than um, a, a sector like yours, where you have long lead times for investment, for design and so on, are the realities out of sync with the kind of cycles that you have to go through to develop new machines, modernize new machines, to innovate and so on? I, I think yes. And, and here we see the, the huge advantage of electrical vehicles. Entering the, the car industry you used to have two big barriers for entry, and it was engine and it was a gearbox. Today, anyone can buy an electrical motor and anyone can buy a gearbox that fits to an electrical motor. Okay. That, commodity. Thank you. Uh, Li Shu, I wonder if you're with us from uh, LXI Capital. I'm hoping that you can jump in and the microphone will head in your direction. If you're there, would you like to uh, put a point about globalization? Nick? Indeed, yes. Who's that? It's, just why you, it's, it's Stuart. So I'm just, Hello, Stuart. Before, I, just before I drop the mic, I just wanted to throw a little bit of a span in the works that maybe it's certainly Henry might better reflect on a bit. One of the aspects around kind of globalization has always been driven around kind of uh, commerce and economy and kind of GDP related factors. I just wonder what people's views are on maybe the rebirth of globalization needs to focus on more humanitarian impact. When you consider the absolute extreme circumstances and uh, dreadful circumstances that are going on currently in Ukraine, you know, the focus here is about people's lives. And I think you know, the broader perspective around a rebirth of globalization, and we talk, we've talked many times around donor economics and those kind of areas in terms of how we need to refocus that. Maybe this is what the rebirth needs to be. We need to focus on more humanitarian um, aspects as opposed Henry. to just finance, shall we say. Henry. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, let's just come back to the basics. Maslow's pyramid, right? Safety. It's in the bottom of it. Right now, that's where Ukraine is. Uh, but obviously, you, know, you are absolutely correct. The future, if you look back in history, we saw the pros and cons of capitalism, communism, socialism, and so on. Right? Today, we clearly understand, and Bo made a great deal of point of it, and we can see this throughout any report you can read. We are all in this together. COVID proved to this to all of us. Logistics is the same thing. Think of COVID as logistics system that spread out so quickly around the world. So if we are talking about logistical systems, 
They are uniting the world. Therefore, what next has to be done? What business model do businesses around the world need to develop in order to have social impact at the core of their mission versus strictly profits? I believe, and this is what we are trying to do, we're building what we call in Ukraine economy of trust. We believe due to blockchain technology, we can create the trust that allows us to move things much faster with much less cost to moving those stuffs, making sure that in-time inventory works with multiple resources backing up each other. So backup systems must be built in place because right now we see crisis due to supply chain all over the world. We saw during COVID crisis, we see right now during the war uh, in Ukraine, and I 100% agree with you, and this is our mission here, is that human factor, human capital going forward, is everything, it's all we have. Let's put it this way. That's my opinion. Thank you, Nick. All right. Li Shu, I think you've joined us now. So what's your point, please? Welcome. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go um, ahead. Okay. So personally, I'm very heavily involved in renewable and also cryptocurrency business, uh, uh, both as investor and also service provider for investors. And based on what I see is uh, the world is going to a uh, transition um, with the old sovereign structure and, and the new sovereign structure, which yet to define. Um, and the, the, the transition create a lot of uh, social and political and economic changes, uh, willingly and unwillingly. Uh, so this has been create um, dramatic impact to the current, um, the global structure, mainly US, China, and Russia. Um, and and, and the, all of all three, in a way, are uh, under threat of the new um, social and economic uh, structure uh, because their power is going to be weakened no matter what with the upcoming of crypto and then uh, blockchain technology interruption. Lee, you, talk also, a, you talk about a transition there, but is it actually more of a shock, much of what is happening, whether it be COVID, the climate emergency, now what's happening in Europe and Ukraine? These are shocks more than just transitions. Uh, I would not say shocks. It's going to happen. Uh, we just don't know when and how to happen. Uh, I'm a personally a, a big believer a book called Solving Individuals. Uh, it's already, uh, the book was written 20 years ago. Uh, most things is, is already predicted in the book 20 years ago. So uh, so it's just a matter of when, how this happened. Uh, so that's kind of personal view. Thank you. Right. Nick, can I address uh, these comments, please? So first of all, uh, I want to uh, address multiple things. I want you to realize right now that in Ukraine, right, uh, we are going to see a lot of capital coming from governments, which have to go into infrastructure of the country, critical. What Lee's talking about right now is more critical because institutional money will not come to Ukraine for at least a year. And that's assuming the war is going to stop tomorrow. So what we are do on a mission now is to create a multi-million army of crowdfunders to fund everything from little daycare, where 100 people putting 100 bucks together to build a daycare in the in the, any region of the area, all the way to infrastructure projects. Blockchain and cryptocurrencies tokenization allows us to do this now. I'll give you a very good example. We work specifically with Post Office Ukraine. If you take a physical asset today, a value of it, because we have contracts associated with that physical asset, we can create a secure token that allows people to have asset-backed security which makes financial instruments. Now, when we talk about green economy, we must talk about carbon credits. Carbon credits are divided. You can create them through, obviously, greenhouse gas emissions. You can preservation or sequestration, right? And Ukraine has enormous opportunity there because carbon credits is a liquid financial instrument. It will become within, and it's a multi-trillion dollar industry within the next 10 years. Tesla today earns literally 10% of its revenue from selling carbon credits. But for countries like Ukraine, Kazakhstan included, that's becoming a financial instrument that will provide liquidity and provide assurance to investors their money will be paid back because carbon credit is another asset that can be secured. Thank you, Lee, for your comments. And thank you, Nick. Thank you. But Bo, do you want to come in on that at all? No. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's straightforward. That's great. Yes. Don't take offense. Jan Siemens, can you join me um, uh, from ITIC? 
Uh, are you are you still there? I can see hands have gone up, but I don't know whether the hands are still there or whether people have moved on. Uh, why why are you uh, uh, we we looking waiting for the next one? I would like to make a, a little more comments. I just spoke with my business partner on the renewable side, so uh, of course uh, what you mentioned was was earth, was correct, and that's the impact on the Ukraine side. But um, I mean. I'm purely speaking from a global capital standpoint. On the other side, the Russian capital was uh, is is sectional right now, right? They cannot do this, do that, or go anywhere. So, so that's just between Ukraine and Russia, and this might even trigger bigger scale of uh, disruption, uh, hypothetically Taiwan issue. So, uh, my, myself is from China, so we also concerned about how this going to impact to to the future. Um, so, I would say uh, uh, crypto blockchain is definitely a a um, a backup plan. Let's say that way. Yeah, and are you able to join us at the moment? Maybe not. Who else can join us? Um, Shambhatia, are you there still? I'm, I'm trying to invite you in if you'd like to come in. No luck there either. Sham, are you there? I'm trying to give you the microphone. I've, Michael Froman, by the way, can't get in. Um, he couldn't log in, so apologies for that. Um, I think you've already gone to the mic. So for whatever reason, um, I can't connect anyone else. So I apologize for that. Um, is anyone else, has anyone else grabbed the microphone uh, while I've been um, looking at the, the main guests? No, it doesn't look like it. Um, okay. Henry, is there anything more you'd like to add about what you were saying, particularly on cryptocurrencies and so on? I mean, it sounds really quite extraordinary. You were able to talk with this kind of level of vision, given the horror of what your, your country is enduring at the moment. Well, my, I had a very long road before the war started of several years building this up. So uh, we, what we call but, this... But let, me, let me just check. I mean, we're 10 days into the war. Yes. Could it be resurrected very quickly if, if necessary? It's nine days. And the answer is yes. We actually were in development phase. So we have not pushed the product out because the product has obviously very many moving parts. Uh, it takes a lot of effort and coordinated effort on many parts, including physical. We, our plan was to build the blockchain ecosystem called the operating system. Uh, think of it as enterprise software for all types of transactions, any transaction from any size of any sort. Right. So that's the key because we wanted to bring transparency and blockchain does that. Remember, blockchain is also immutable. So for us, economy of trust has to be built as a software for enterprise software product as the physical uh, aspects of Ukraine rise up. And we're talking about physical facilities like uh, logistics park and the like. So then the next step is we, we, we now think about it that Ukraine has enormous sizes. I want everybody to realize what happened in Ukraine and why I moved back from United States is because of decentralization. In Ukraine to this day, prior to the war, Soviet centrally planned economy was still in place. Today, due to centralization law that was really came live last year, we can build economies bottom up. What does that mean? It means that we can think of governance in a whole different way. We talk about real-time governance. That's the opportunity where Ukraine, what I call digital democracy, right? We can create the real-time governance. I want you to realize a simple swipe left or right, right, allows us to vote immediately on any issue. Now, next thing is how do you create this opportunity, that utopia of sort, using green economy? Because think about the fact if you use biomass, because part of our project was producing 24 megawatt power station, biomass power station network throughout the country. Therefore, the whole city is going to be green and creating carbon credit all the time, which can be given back to the citizens of the municipality. So we will attract people from around the world, not only due to great jobs and new opportunities and new economies, but also because their social aspects of their life can be completely wiped out from, I'm talking about wiped out from headache point of view, where everything included in the city. If you live in New York in a tall building, you pay a management fee. Imagine that now we have, an, due to technology and due, by the way, to blockchain technology, we are now able to build cities 
incorporating that, creating real-time governance where all of the services, social services of that city are included of being a citizen of that municipality. So that's the impact the blockchain can have. All right. Now, look, we've got a couple of minutes only. Bo, you've been very uh, uh, you've been very patient there while I've been trying to get others to join. So I'm going to almost close the shop now. But what I'd like to ask you is, you know, you've been in a new job in a new country for six months. The world has been moving incredibly quickly, often in negative ways for so many reasons. And we've had the warning from the president of the World Bank, David Malpass, overnight that this is going to be an enormous hit on the global economy. How much are you having to now calibrate in your mind and certainly with the, the owners of, of your company, cal calibrate in a different way and urge people to think differently, to think the unthinkable? How much is that now driving um, much of much of your thinking process at a time which, where for many companies, this can be about survival still post COVID. Yeah, first a huge benefit for me is we are 100 government owned. Uh, the second thing is that the economies have been doing extremely well, and we are on the growth path. What I see in my responsibility, I, I need to forecast a flat line or, or a decline, and I also think it's important that. For us managers, I, I may not be a perfect manager, but in times like this, we need to do four things. We need to give people hope. We need to give people direction. We need to allocate resources, people and money, and we need to follow up. And that's what I'm trying to do every day. But every morning I wake up to something new. But you've got to take risk as well, haven't you? You've got to make a judgment, but you, you can't be sure that the decision, not you personally, but it's got you've got to have the right to experiment safely. Absolutely. Well, let's leave it there at three fifteen. Unlike me, three fifteen London time. Of... <laughs> and I'm I'm getting I'm getting panels blinking at me from this machine. Thank you very much indeed, Bo. Thank you, Henry, as well. Mike Froman. Well, pleasure Sanchez. to meet you. And Bo, I'm in Kiev. If you need anything, uh, so we're right. not too far apart. But thank you very much, Nick, for hosting this. And, and Mike Froman sends his apologies from MasterCard, uh, the fact that he couldn't, for whatever reason, get on. So it's one of those days. But I hope at least we've managed the, the technology and the software to the point where you've appreciated some of the insights you've received. Bo, Henry, thank you very much indeed, and everyone else as well. Thank you. I'm going to now close the session. Please bye -bye. stay with Ukraine. Thank you.